Good afternoon. Welcome to Ethereal Mechanics Foundation Series video number five. In this video we're going to discuss the reference frame of new electromagnetism. We're also going to discuss relativity and how that applies to new electromagnetism. So where were we from the previous videos? Well, we came up with three models, a second order equations of force charge models that we've been called new electromagnetism. But the curious thing is, well, well, what do you measure these accelerations or velocities relative to? And some of you are saying, well, 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 well how does that matter? Well, let's consider this. What's a reference frame? A reference frame is a point of view, a perspective, a frame of reference, for lack of a better word. And let me explain this busy picture to you. Here you've got two ships, a, a message in a bottle, a, a rock popping out of the water, an island, a cloud moving in the sky, and a star up in the sky. Let's say you're on one of these ships and you want to measure your velocity. Well, what do you measure your velocity relative to? The water, which would be indicated by the, the bottle. Do you measure your velocity relative to the rock? Do you measure your velocity relative to the cloud? Do you measure your velocity relative to the island? I mean, consider that these two ships with nothing else there, maybe on the ocean with no other perspective, and they're passing. Well, how do you know they're passing? Maybe one's standing still and the other one's in motion. Or perhaps it's the other way, where this one is standing still and this one's in motion. Or perhaps they have both have a little bit of motion in the game. Or maybe they're both, both moving backwards, but one's just moving a little bit faster. Okay, so velocity is a relative measurement. It's always measured relative to something else. Acceleration 2, for the most part. Consider that if you have a cannonball firing solution, let's say one ship is going to fire its cannonballs at another, well, you're going to measure position of A relative to ship B. Your cannons are going to fire, you know, your captain's going to say, well, the other ship is three points off the port bow, and then that they, the guys in the gun deck are going to know that they've got to turn their cannons so far from the point of the bow in that direction, and that's where they're going to see the target that the captain's looking at. Okay, that's a frame of reference. Hull dynamics. Well, how your hull reacts with the water and the, the, the viscosity of the water and the Bernoulli effect, well, that you're going to measure the, then the ship, the velocity of the ship relative to the water to get a good indicator in how to compute that. The thrust that your sails produce is going to be the velocity of the wind relative to the sails. Okay, if you sit here and say, well, my thrust is going to be relative to my velocity relative to the star, it isn't going to mean anything. For thrust, it's going to be the velocity of the wind relative to your sail, which is going to be more indicated by the velocity of the cloud relative to you, considering that the cloud is more likely an indicator of airspeed relative to you. For navigation, well, okay, what's your land speed? Well, then you measure your, the velocity of the ship relative to a stable land point. Well, what's your airspeed? Well, you can measure your ship relative to the cloud if you kind of have a good measure of airspeed. What's your water speed? Well, you can measure the ship relative to the bottle, which should be a pretty good indicator of what your water speed is. Okay, for navigation, you're probably going to, you know, measure your position relative to stable land artifacts and, know, and then look up on a map to see what your position is. If you're out in the middle of the ocean and have no visible land cues, you're going to use the stars to navigate by. Okay, so I think I beat a horse to death on that. So the reference frame is important. Okay, so for any scientific measurement or observation requires us to understand what the proper or useful reference frame is in which to measure which the measurement's meaningful, like land speed or air speed or hull dynamics, yada yada yada. And consider this example. You've got a train that's going down the track, and you've got three observers. You've got a lineman that's in front of the train, a lineman that's behind the train, and the conductor in the back of in one of the, the cars. Well, we know from Doppler effect that the lineman in the front is going to experience an increase in the frequency of the, of the whistle. The lineman that's behind the train is going to hear a downing of the frequency of the whistle. And because the conductor is moving with the train, he's not going to notice any difference in the whistle of the train, whether the, whistle, whether the train's in motion or whether the train is standing still. And so knowing what the, what's the useful reference frame here is important to understanding how to compute everything. And so what's the reference frame for new electromagnetism? So let's go back. I'm going to take you on a guided tour of the evolution of reference frames, or what relativity calls reference frames. But, and, and let me just tell you that the historical order in which these things were figured out is a bit convoluted. It's not really good for understanding. So I'm going to give you the tour in a logical step-by-step -step fashion, the way it should have been figured out, 
So we can see a completely different understanding of what really occurred in the past 200 years. So first we have to understand that we live in a twister world. This is like an amusement park ride where if, you know, if you're here, th these twist around this and this whole thing twists around. If you've ridden on this ride, you know it's very, there's a lot of g-force involved in riding on this ride. But we do live on a situation like this. We live on the planet which is rotating and it's going around the sun. The sun's going around the galaxy. And so there's a lot of these motions. Our net velocity through the universe is di different day by day and by night as well as by season, yet we have no perception of these alleged changes in velocity. Why is that? Well, because nature is nice to us. Otherwise, civilization may not be possible. I mean, consider that in the early days of man, we just built buildings by stacking blocks on top of each other. Well, take a set of kids' toy blocks on this system and try to build with those toy blocks on this while trying to take the ride. Your blocks will be splooned all over the place. We'd have experiments would have different results. There'd be tidal waves, extreme weather, etc., etc. Science would be difficult because in a twister world, Newton's apple would have fallen straight, not straightened down, it would have gone on a path something like this. Try to figure out the laws of gravity then. And so we have invented this thing that we call today, we call it Lorentz invariance. It wasn't called Lorentz invariance back then, but that's what it would have been called if we were to name it back then. And this is often why you often hear scientists proclaim that you should get the same result regardless if you are stationary or on a moving train. Why? Because who knows if the train is moving for or against the velocity of the Earth. It could very well be that the, that the total velocity of this experiment being conducted on the train is less velocity because it's moving against the, the velocity of the Earth through the universe. And therefore, our experiments, because nature is nice to us, should give us the same result whether we're in a building or on a moving train because the whole thing is in motion anyway. And we really don't know what the net velocity of anything is, but we should get the same results because nature is nice to us. But we learned from the Doppler shift thing that the Lorentz invariance is actually an illusion. Okay, the Doppler shift explains to us that the invariance is an illusion. Well, why is that? Well, because the, the conductor moving on the train experiences the train whistle as if he's standing still or moving. It makes no difference to the observer moving on the train. Uh, that's moving with the, in other words, the observer and the event move together and so therefore the observer cannot detect the Doppler shift. Because even though the, the, the waves are getting Doppler shifted through the air as it goes back to him, because he's moving into the waves, he's actually shifting them back up. And so the Doppler shift is occurring, but because the event and the observer are varying the same amount, okay, it's not Lorentz invariance that we're seeing. It's what we call now Lorentz covariance. Okay, because the observer and the event are moving together, their effects through the medium compensate and it looks to the observer the same as if the train were sitting still. And that's what we call covariance. It's not invariance because it is varying. We know it's varying with the velocity. It's just that the observer, because he's moving with the, the event, his variance is varying in such a way to compensate for what he's seeing or observing. Okay? So understand that, that, that there is no invariance. It is actually covariance, where both the observer and the event are varying together, and they're, they are varying in the same way as to make the effect look like the same as if he were standing still. But we know that, the vary, that things are varying because observers that are standing still are getting two other different measured frequencies. Let's be very clear about that. And so we could actually reinvent the relativity of sound waves. Okay, because all sounds are Doppler shifted, we know that. Okay, but because the observer's perceptions are undopplered, undopplered based on their velocity relative to the medium, then we can compute all effects based on the relative velocities between the events and observer and discard any discussion of the medium. Okay, if we did all the computations saying, well, this is Doppler shifted relative to the velocity of the air, it becomes to the point where you can actually throw away the medium altogether and just consider the relative motions between everything. Where covariance is because is a, is a special case of relativity because the velocity is the same. But regardless of the velocity of the medium, if you just take the velocity of the event to each observer, 
you can compute the right Doppler shifts. You don't, it doesn't matter what the velocity of the wind is. You could have gale force winds blowing. And that will cancel out in the calculations such that you only have to consider the observer relative to the event. The observer relative to the event. The observer relative to the event. And the observer moving with the event because he's moving relatively together. We call that covariance. Okay, so covariance is actually a special case of relativity. It's relativity where the velocities are the same. We just kind of call that covariance because they're varying the same way. Okay, so we have relativity here and we can totally ignore the medium. And if we were to do a calculation of the speed of sound using velocity equals frequency times lambda, then regardless of which observer is, they're all going to measure the same speed of sound. So sound is the same to all observers in all reference frames. Gee, doesn't that sound familiar? And the velocity of the medium is of no relevance here. Again, we can drop the medium. Doesn't this sound familiar? So the fact of sound relativity is speed of sound is the same to all observers in all reference frame. So we can ignore the speed of the sound relative to the medium. And that relative motion between reference frames or observer and observed is all that matters for calculations. Again, you can ignore the motion relative to the medium. Again, the medium is ignored. Here's little Albert Einstein, the little monkey, gets a bright idea. So, special relativity was sold to us in 1905. It just repackaged what we already knew about waves and what's into what he called special relativity. The only original idea in the work, in my opinion, is time dilation. But he does not explain what causes time dilation. It was inferred to maintain the illusion of covariance slash relativity. And again, we can ignore the medium. And because we can ignore the medium, we have come across the greatest heist in scientific history. Because the little monkey Einstein is highly honored and revered for his scientific genius when he really just sold us something we already knew. Okay, Oz never get, did give nothing to the Tin Man that the Tin Man didn't already have. But the Tin Man was happy to get it, not realizing he already had it. And that's what we were. We were the Tin Man. And because of our stupidity and gullibility, we accepted the irrelevance of the ether, and totally rejected further discussion of it, thinking that only stupid people would further consider it. After all, relativity gets the right answers without considering the medium, just like the sound relativity does. But here's where the greatest heist in scientific theory. Eleven years later, in 1916, the little monkey introduced general relativity. Can anyone guess what he again repackaged and sold us? Can anyone guess what did he now repackage and sell it to us again? A medium. Oh, but he called it the fabric of space-time. I'm sorry, friends, it rose by any other name. And the little monkey was careful not to discuss the propagation of light with respect to this new medium. Otherwise, people would have caught on that he basically sold us another ether. So in the next video, I'll show you that light and gravity are the same damn thing. So this is the greatest bait and switch scam in history of science. After, after all that rejection of the medium and special relativity, 11 years later, the little monkey sells us a medium right back to us. Okay, a medium is a medium. I don't care if you call it the fabric of space-time, the ether, the zero-point energy, quantum flux, dark matter, dark energy. We always come back to em unempty space, and we'll, we'll come back to this later. So again, I just want to reiterate that covariance is a special case of relativity, and relativity is a special case, a simplification that allows us to ignore our absolute velocity, that's the velocity relative to the medium, when making scientific observations. But it's a special case. And we have to keep coming back to the medium because it doesn't explain everything. It's just a good simplification that's, that's valid under limited conditions. For example, we go back to the rel sound relativity. Okay, sound relativity is a special case because if the train were going in reverse at the speed of sound, the observer moving with the train would never hear the whistle. Because if the train were moving this direction at the speed of sound, he would never hear anything. And therefore, there are conditions under which sound relativity breaks down. Okay, and there's other situations where the special case, the simplification offered by covariance relativity, is not useful. In other words, it gets the wrong answer. Okay, and so therefore, general 
is universal. This is why general solutions require us to return to the medium. That's why the little monkey had to return and offer us a medium back, because you can't do everything with the special case, special relativity. And that's true in the sound case or the light case, because what you have to do everything, if you want to do everything, you have to come back to a medium. The relativity stuff is just a special case that allows you to ignore the medium, but that's only good under limited conditions. So in order to explain how the illusion of the special case relativity is manifested, a theory of everything okay, has to explain how in this special case, special relativity, whether it's sound or light, can give you the illusion of covariance or relativity. And we have that with the Lorentz, uh, contract, Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction case because this velocity is the velocity of the experiment relative to the medium. And is with this contraction equation that you can explain the covariance of the Michelson-Morley experiment. Without it, there should be no covariance to the Michelson-Morley, but because of it you have the covariance. And you get the illusion of the Michelson-Morley experiment that you're not in motion. You need this equation, but this has to be based on the velocity relative to the medium. That is well understood. So relativity is just a special case. That's both the same for sound relativity or light relativity. Waves moving in a medium. Okay, so the reference frame for new electromagnetism, because I was able to derive time dilation from new electromagnetism, then the reference frame for new electromagnetism is also the medium, which is the same medium for the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction, which is the ether. Okay, but new electromagnetism explains covariance. The bane to the existence of relativity has been magnetism, or rather, the awful models of magnetism that we've been stuck with for 150 years. New electromagnetism has more correct models of magnetism that actually explain how the illusion of relativity slash covariance occurs. And let's explore one of the many moving magnet problems that cause turmoil between relativity and classical magnetism. Let's take a moving magnet, for example. If magnetism is due to the velocity of charges relative to the medium, then according to classical theory, we should, have a me we should have been able to detect the velocity of the medium with a simple loop of wire. Because if you have a current in a loop of wire, the current has to be same in all sides of the loop of the wire. And the current is indicated by a number of charges moving at velocity. Let's call this velocity V. Now if you take this loop and you now start moving it by velocity V, well, then these charges are moving at 2V total, and these charges are moving at 0V relative to the medium. Oh, this V is relative to the medium. So therefore, there should be zero magnetic field on one side and double the magnetic field on the other side. Okay, but we don't see this. We see, no matter how we measure this, we see the same magnetic field on both sides, regardless of the motion. So how can that be? Well, according to new electromagnetism, we have to consider all the charges, because if we look at a conductor of wire, it's got equal number of positive and negative charges when there's no current in the wire. Okay, then if you put a current in the wire, you're going to get a charge in motion. This represents a number of charges in motion. For every charge that's in motion due to your current, that's going to leave a corresponding positive charge uncovered. And so when you consider your current loop in a proper account for all the charge motion, you're going to have V for the charges in motion, V for, let's say we're still using V for the velocity of the experiment. Okay, that means these are not moving, these are moving at 2V, these are moving at 1V, and these are also moving at 1V in this direction. Okay, having a positive charge move at 1V in this direction, the same thing as having the same amount of charge of negative charge move in the opposite direction. So it would be like having a current of 4 moving at the velocity v in this direction, negative charges. Because we have 2 times the velocity on these but 1 times the negative, this subtracts one of these and you get the equivalent of 4 charges moving at velocity v in this direction. So now your magnetic field is completely imbalanced on both sides and it doesn't matter at what direction and velocity this this loop moves, you're going to get the illusion of covariance slash relativity. Another example, as this is in Einstein's 1905 paper that introduced the world to relativity, opens with a description of the magnet conductor problem. 
you can go to this and look at this on your own. You can apply new electromagnetism to show you're going to get the same answer no matter what. Just treat this magnetic field as a loop of current, okay, and account for both moving and its stationary charge, the same for both. You'll find you're going to get the same answer regardless of how the experiment moves. There's nothing magical about it. It's just accounting for all the motions of the charges relative to the medium. Okay, but the little monkey repackaged and sold us everything. He really took us to the cleaners. Because physicists in the early to mid-1900s said that traveling faster than the speed of sound is an impossibility. It didn't matter that military cartridges of the day, the bullet would arrive long before the crack of the rifle did, which means the bullets, this part here, were moving faster than the speed of sound. But facts don't seem to bother physicists because their equations showed that as velocity approaches the speed of sound, the force acting on the bullet or the, the, the object is going to go to pretty much infinity and you're never going to be able to cr cross the sound barrier. And so Einstein just took this and re crossed out sound, replaced it with light, and he sold that to us too. Because where there's an engineer, there's a way. It requires us to stop ignoring the medium and stop listening to physicists. Because in 1947, engineers, by taking an airframe designed very much like a, like a rifle projectile, were able to break the sound barrier and were able to break it you know, pretty readily these days. And so we have to stop listening to physicists because I'm telling you right now, faster than light starships are indeed in our future. As long as we don't blow ourselves up and we can break the stupid barrier first, we're going to break the light barrier. Again, we can't ignore the medium. And what's the medium? Well, many theories require unempty space. They, some call it the fabric of space-time, the ether, the quantum flux, zero-point energy, dark matter, dark energy. It does not matter if this stuff is real or only an abstraction as long is it provides useful answers. So I chose ether without the A. I chose to call this stuff the ether to show lineage to the classical ether model with the A. Some differences are as my model is not stationary, it's very dynamic. It's not fine and wafty, it's very dense. Matter is to ether as soap bubbles are to air. And we're going to show more of the ether model in the next video. So let's cover the homework from video number three. We're using new induction. Okay, and we're putting new induction. We're going to use for the excel for the centripetal acceleration the velocity, the tangential velocity squared over the radius of the particle, and because of a lot tangential velocity, it's going to be c squared over r p. So then we calculate new induction for the effects of this charge on the target, and then the effects of this charge on the target, taking into account d minus r p and d plus r p. And then we're substituting into for acceleration this. Okay, because this charge is accelerating this way here, that's going to be a, re a uh, repulsive force. That's what this one is. Because this one is accelerating this way, that's going to be an attractive force, the reason for the sign. Okay, then we condense, and then we condense. Okay, and over here we're going to multiply this times this and this, and take this and multiply by this and this to bring these fractions together. That's what this is. And then we condense down. We condense down. And then we say down here that, OK, well, because d squared is much, 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 much greater than the radius of the particle, we're going to cross this out, leaving just this. And here we have 2 times the force. But because if you go back to uh, EMF004, you remember, in order to get the proper model of an electron, we had to use half charges. So if we substitute half charges in for here, we get this, which is Coulomb's model. So this doesn't mean that new induction is actually the Coulomb force, but it may mean that what we measure from a great distance of a subatomic particle may be a combination of forces from different effects. It may not all be. Coulomb's force may be a mosaic of different f effects. One could be that the inertial, the induction is, in fact, whole or partially what we measure when we measure a Coulomb field but we still have to go and disambiguate. But regardless, we've got to remember that new electromagnetism encompasses the measured effects above the level of the electron. Trying to use these models to derive the lower level uh, effects, which we're doing now, is problematic, rule of acquisition 10. So we need to be careful and find um, other effects in our organization to help us disambiguate. This is what ethereal mechanics new wave theory is all about. Here's the new homework. Use the middle term of new magnetism and do the same thing as before. These rot our orbit at C, the uh, tangential velocity, the speed of light C. 
compute the effects on the target charge at, that's at distance D, and D is much, much greater than RP. Answer will be in the next video. So to go forward, we need to break the beautiful gift of covariance relativity that nature has given us. Because new electromagnetism shows the mechanisms of this gift, we now know how to do that. Basically, what we need to do is break the charge balance of our experiments. And that should show us. Thank you very much. Thank you for the donations. Sorry that this video was so long, but there was a lot of things to cover. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.